Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Stephanie Neal. I'm Senior Editor at Automation World Magazine, and I'm here to facilitate this webinar dedicated to giving you some new ideas on how to automate preventive maintenance tasks quickly. This webinar is sponsored by Telet, a provider of end-to-end -end IoT solutions. Included among the company's products and services is an innovative data-centric software platform designed for the industrial Internet of Things. We'll be hearing more about this shortly, but here's what I want you to think about before we kick off the conversation. How much time does it take just to schedule your plant floor preventive maintenance initiatives? How many layers of code and system data do you have to go through to connect to PLCs and enterprise systems? How flexible is your setup? Can you change it on the fly, for example? Chances are these are not easy questions to answer, so that's why we're here today, to help you find an easier way to automate the process. Our experts on the webinar include Duby Margulet, the General Manager of IoT Factory Solutions at Telet, and David De La Rosa, Telet's Vice President of DeviceWise Industry 4.0. Both of these gentlemen had years, decades actually, of experience with automation, engineering, and IoT. They've been helping industrial companies and OEMs transform their business by overcoming technology challenges. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you can ask a question at any time during this presentation. Just click on the question box on the right side of your screen and type it in. We'll be collecting questions while our speakers are presenting, and then we'll address all of your questions at the end of the webinar. I also want to let you know that this webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand within the next 24 to 48 hours. So with that, let's get started. I'm going to hand the microphone over to Dewey to give you a bit more background on the issues surrounding preventive maintenance and offer some insight on what can be done to change how it's done. Dewey, over to you. Thank you, Stephanie. And uh, Good morning, everybody. Thank you for taking the time and joining this webinar. And before we jump into the, in the topic of automating preventive maintenance, I wanted to give a quick overview about who Telet is and um, a little bit uh, insight about our product. So Telet is one of the largest pure play IoT providers. We do hardware, connectivity, and platforms. Our platform group uh, roots is from the late 80s from, with IBM Industrial Automation. And we've been doing shop floor data collection and IT to OT convergence since the 90s. We have over 1,000 employees worldwide, uh, over 7,000 customers, and we're involved in most of the significant IoT projects out there. So device-wise for factory or device-wise platform is our industrial IoT software platform that is a result of thousands of many years of development. Um, and when we architected this software, we wanted to focus on providing and simplifying data processing in many environments, including shop floor environment. And the key frameworks that we, we try to provide our customers is the flexibility to connect anything, the agility, to process data quickly and the scalability to grow as needed. So talking a little bit about the topic at hand, um, scheduling preventive maintenance. And you know our experience with our customers, we often hear about the manual process of following the manufacturer's recommended maintenance cycles. It is often a very manual process. Um, it requires an operator to go through the line, through the equipment, identify the, um, the hours of usage or the cycles of usage, and scheduling the automate uh, or scheduling the the maintenance ticket later on for for the team to come and, and perform whatever task the manufacturer recommended to do. It, it is a very mundane task, and we also heard from customers, people are respond, telling us that there's a difference between experienced and non-experienced technicians. So how do we automate the process? You know, it, it sounds very intuitive. You know, on one hand, we have the data. On the other hand, we have our automatic scheduling system. So, you know, why can't we just connect the two? Well, it's, it's not necessarily as easy as it appears because there's a wide variety of assets that we need to talk to. There is a wide variety of plant maintenance system. And there is some logic that we need to implement to 
actually open the ticket. So when we're looking at the landscape and the complexity and we see and, and we've, we've been seeing this over and over in multiple customer bases that there very, there's a very diversified background on the asset side. There is also a very diversified background on the ERP side or, or on the IT side. And then different developers using different languages and, and, and different protocols and how do you integrate everything. It requires a lot of custom code to be written to create that solution and often it takes a lot of time. So speaking about custom code, um, it is limiting and we are not always aware of how limiting it is. So when we try to break a typical project such as preventive maintenance scheduling, a significant portion of this project is going to be invested into connecting to the assets. Another significant uh, uh, part of the project will be into integrating into the IT system. The actual business logic coding is not a significant part. It's a usually a very simple logic to implement. Effectively, over 60% of the project is de dedicated for connectivity, both on the southbound side to the assets and northbound to the enterprise IT. Then we are ending up with a project with a typical life cycle of five to ten years that is heavily dependent on the developer. What happens when the developer is no longer available? And finally, when you start touching your assets and you start touching your IT systems, you're often disrupting your manufacturing flow. So what if we could have an out-of-the-box connectivity solution, minimizing the asset data collection code? and minimizing your enterprise IT integration code. That leaves your project cycle to be much shorter. And effectively, you can do many more projects at the same time. What we're going to show you is how DeviceWise simplifies that data collection, data processing, and data transport to IT. And we're We've been developing in the last 30 years different sets of drivers and connectors to almost any asset out there. And all of those are native drivers and connectors, and this is a sample of what we're doing on the Southbound side. Um, we not only talk to PLC, we also talk to, for example, DC tools. And we have a wide variety of libraries to read data from DC tools. On the Northbound side, you know, we can push data to a simple SQL database, and we can also push data to SAP, for example, SAP PM. And recently, we've also added additional connectors to cognitive systems like IBM Watson and Microsoft Azure. So your platform allows you to scale and grow as needed um, and, and provide you with a simple framework, as I mentioned, that provides you both northbound and southbound connectivity. The, the final part of that is the business logic, and our logic engine is a visual uh, code implementation. So your business logic implementation is also fairly simple. It's very intuitive, so even if your developer is no longer with you, you can still pretty much understand what's going on. You can easily iterate through developing different business logic implementation, and your whole project becomes a much easier to uh, manage. So, I hope this framework gives you an idea of what DeviceWise does, and the topic of this webinar is how to automate preventive maintenance system. So what we're going to do is actually create, on the fly, a project that automates those, uh, an example of preventive maintenance system. And I'll hand it over to David, I'll make him presenter, and he will show you how to implement this project. and. By the time we're done with the webinar, we'll be implementing a full project. David, we can't hear you. Thank you, Dovi. Thank you, Dovi. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah, everybody? we can hear you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So, so what we're looking at right now is an application called the Workbench. It's an application that we use to configure device-wise and it's not needed to actually 
in run device wise, but just to configure and monitor. As uh, Dudi uh, explained, uh, we have uh, the OT side, which is represented by this tab here, the devices, and the IT side represented by this tab here, the enterprise. So what we're going to do first is talk a little bit about the devices or the OT side. First, uh, I'm going to show you uh, how in DeviceWise you go about to connect to an OT device. So we support uh, many, many types of devices. Uh, of course, the DC tools from Atlas Copco, uh, Apex Clico, uh, the entire Mitsubishi line, the uh, Rockwell line, the Omron line, the Siemens line, and, and many more. So what I want to uh, show you really quickly here, how to define uh, a Rockwell device so you see how easy this is. So you basically, um, pick the device type, in this case, control uh, logic, give it a name, uh, put the IP address, in this case it's 172.27.14.233, uh, and then uh, enumerate program types true, and then we press validate to make sure that we can reach the device. This does an Ethernet IP connection. We save this definition. We start this definition. And if you go to the variables tab, I'm sorry, I think I didn't really So I don't know why I didn't see the variables. But okay, now I'm going to define a Siemens device. In this case, it will be an S7300. Then you pick down the panel. The PLC type, in this case, is an S7300. The address, in this case, is 172.27.14.103. And you validate. I made a mistake here. Dot 103. Validate. 72, 14, 15. Okay, sounds like I lost connectivity to Florida. So what I'm going to do next is uh, define an Atlas Copco device. We have a simulator here on the system. I'm going to call this uh, Atlas, and then you'll see how we define devices like DC tools. So we pick this, uh, the power focus line, we put the IP address, validate, it's fine, and we save, and then we start. Then if you go here to the PM Atlas definition, you see some of the properties of the uh, Atlas Coco device, like controller name, last message received, and so on. So this is how you define um, the uh, OT side of the house, and you could read things and you could write things. Of course, I have the, the, uh, the admin authority here. There is a role-based security that we, you could apply to limit the access to the OT devices. So that's about the uh, OT devices. Uh, we do not use OPC per se to communicate to devices, uh, but we have our native drivers, but we could leverage uh, the uh, OPC uh, servers if they're out there under Windows. So now I'm going to focus a little bit on the IT side and on the enterprise side. So on the IT side, device-wise support numerous types of IT systems. The most common IT systems uh, out there today are relational databases, and we basically support uh, a good amount, uh, the IBM line, the Oracle line, the SQL server, uh, of course, uh, the SAP HANA, the OSI PISA Historian, we also support MongoDB, Postgres, and MySQL. Uh, so just to give you an example, okay, so that's on the database side, but we also support numerous types of IT systems. For example, web services, any, many systems are front-ended with a web service interface, so we support that. IBM Watson for cognitive computing, uh, SAP ERP, 
uh, SAP PM is the preventive maintenance a product from SAP. We support it with this connector also. MSMQ is Microsoft uh, uh, queuing system, of course, IBM, NQ, and uh, JMS is a Java messaging system. So many MESs and big IT systems are built on top on, on an app server uh, foundation. So all transporting device-wise, uh, basically you configure the credentials, the endpoints, and that's how you reach it. Um, the all transporting device-wise have this feature built into them called store and forward. And what that simply means is that if you elect to use it, then if the IT system is down, all transactions uh, are stored on a FIFO persistent queue so that when uh, the IT system is back in line, then we'll deliver the data. So basically, there is a no data loss. When you select this, uh, you tell us how much to use of the disk uh, space. Uh, so the very simple mapping log is another feature where you could see the interactions between the OT and the IT world. So you see what data is sent, what data is retrieved, a very powerful uh, feature. So I created a couple of, uh, pre-created a couple of transports. This is a transport for a SQL server uh, that I have uh, on this computer here. That is the IP address. Notice all you need to supply is location, credentials, and database type. And when you press uh, validate, uh, it goes and connects with credentials to the uh, server, meaning it's good. So just to give you an idea uh, how quickly we, we talk, uh, how easy it is to set up uh, a, a transaction to SQL, you basically call this uh, tab called transfer map. And transfer map is nothing more, what is it that I'm going to do with this IT system? Am I going to do a select? Am I going to do an insert? Am I going to do uh, a store procedure? Or am I am going to invoke an SAP BAPI? So basically, we discover, uh, we discover everything. So what are we going to do here is, uh, and I think you may have already created it. OK, we can do this here. So this is called, I'm going to edit an existing I work recorded. I actually want to delete it. We'll do it from scratch. You see how this works. So we're going to create a new operation that will actually create a work order. Uh, we'll use a, a work order table on our SQL database. I'm going to call this create work order SQL server. And then you pick the table here. And if you notice, we retrieve uh, the schemas, the tables. Uh, the data types and so on. So we press this button here, map parameters, and we create logical variables uh, for each of these uh, uh, col uh, columns on the database. So I'm going to save this for now. So now what are we going to do next? Uh, so I'll show you a little bit of SAP as well. So if we go to our transport maps, and again, I'll delete this one for now. We'll see how this is done from scratch. We're going to create, we're going to do a, a similar to a PM ticket, create SAP PM ticket or SAP work order. You pick the particular uh, transport to uh, the SAP uh, server, and then you look at the BAPI names like this. And then the server returns, uh, you know, the BAPIs that are available. So here we could pick Y, star, query, and insert, for example. So this is, this, this is how the system went to SAP and retrieved uh, all this information uh, automatically. You notice all I had to enter was the name of the actual operation. So now, well, we're going to go through our actually use case here. Um, we're gonna uh, hand. We're gonna. Uh, we have a DC tool here simulation that after so many cycles, we want to create a work order, and you're going to see how this logic is choreographed very easily with a with a flowchart kind of a, a, a approach. So the first thing we're going to do is create something called a project. 
So I'm not going to call this project preventive maintenance. So I'm going to start it. Uh, before we go into that detail, let me show you the, the rundown cycles. Uh, right now it's 61, so it's increasing uh, 2 per second. So when it reaches 100, that's when we want to create the work order. So the machine is running, we're collecting some information, and when it reaches the 100, we're going to create the ticket. This is just to show you uh, that is what is running. So now back to our project. Now this is where we're going to create the business logic. I'm going to call this, uh, so this is where you create what we call triggers. Triggers is what runs the system. So a trigger is made of two parts. Uh, the, the, the top part is called the event, and the event is what tells the trigger uh, to run. And the bottom part is what we call actions, and it's a collection of function blocks that implement some operation. So let's go to the event here for a second. There's many kinds of events in device wise. One is uh, based purely on the value of a data tag. For example, you could go and pick a particular tag and read it at some interval, and then when it changes or when it's equal to something, you do some logic down here on the logic part. Or it could be on a schedule. It could be as simple as running uh, like every second, or it could be as complicated as a, a, a very uh, sophisticated schedule, like every day of the year except in December or, or something like that. So you could configure exactly when this trigger is to run. So now uh, we also have events uh, from particular devices. For example, the Atlas Copco has events, for example, a controller alarm. If the Atlas Copco detects that something is out of calibration, it could send us a message. So we don't have to be calling the device. The device will tell us uh, when uh, when we when some action needs to be taken. That's a big difference. We also have a powerful feature called unsolicited messages from PLCs in this case. And what that means is the PLC will send you the data when it knows it needs to send it to you. This will eliminate the, 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 the need of polling uh, so many so many times uh, per second. So let the device tell you when it's ready. So we support all kinds, so the Mitsubishi, the Omron, uh, the Siemens, uh, and so on. So this is this is the event. So for for the sake of this demonstration, we're going to when that cycle count it becomes a hundred. So we could say equals. 100 then we want to do something so now let's go down to the logic part of the, the uh, of this trigger so if you notice it's uh, somewhat of a flow chart so when this is equal to 100 this is going to run so if you recall we created a transfer map to put data into the SQL server uh, database so on the left you have a group of actions and this one here is what we'll be using. It's called Enterprise Communication. And we're going to pick this transaction and drop it here. Now we're going to connect the dots here. So basically, when that condition is true, this is going to fire and it's going to create a work order. This one will be on SQL. And all you need to provide is information that comes from the devices, on the OT devices, or from various sources. So here, we're going to say Boca Raton, Florida. This could be line one. Station could be station one. Uh, the count, which uh, it will be 100 in this case, we could pick it up from the actual device here, and then the timestamp is when this event fired, and we'll do this here. So that's it. So that's all we need to do to be able to detect a cycle count, either from this device or any controller that will send you the signal. 
signal or you could be looking at a tag. Uh, on the left side, you notice that there is a, an exit. This is, of course, is the arrow path. So you wire it like this. Of course, you could take actions, you could log, you could do stuff like that. This is the path for store and forward. This is when we are trying to communicate with the IT system, but it fails. So device-wise or, or the customer could decide to take some action. For example, he could drop an email action here and then email the, some supervisor that uh, there is something wrong with the communications with the uh, PM ticket uh, system. Um, of course, you'll fill in the server address, you know, typical, typical email uh, type of, of setup. So for the time being, we're just going to hardwire this here, and then we're going to validate it and make sure that it's uh, oh, field needs to be filled in. So create or order. Then you validate this, and then you save it. And now we're going to start it. So now DeviceWise is monitoring that device, which could be a PLC or, or a DC tool. And then when it reaches the 100 mark, and uh, right now the value is 5. So we should have, we're about to, OK, so we hit one. Perfect timing. So one success happened. So what I'm going to show you next then is you go to our SQL Server database where I have this work order table, and we could do a very quick query. And sure enough, there is the entry that uh, the system uh, created. That was a, a simple, it was a simulated device, but, but it could very well be uh, information from a real PLC or from a DC tool, or it could have been a, a collection of, of, of devices. So at this point, I want to pass it on to, oh, one more, one more question, one more. Uh, for example, you could have uh, then added another transaction here for Oracle. I'm sorry, for, uh, for SAP. So you could drop this here and then pick the SAP work order, associate the data, and also send it to SAP. It's, it's, it looks, the transaction to the SQL or transaction to the SAP look identical. You have the input parameters and the output parameters. So this is sort of how we how we do uh, this kind of business business logic. And at this point, I'll pass it over to uh, to Duby for questions, answers. Thanks, David. Um, you need to make me do we, Okay. I want to remind everybody that you can ask questions. Um, we, we do have some questions coming in, so as soon as we wrap up, I'm going to launch right into that. But um, please do um, ask your questions now so that we can make sure that we get to everybody before the webinar is over. So wanted, we wanted to wrap up this, and I hope by now you saw the power and the flexibility that uh, DeviceWise gives you. Um, this is one example of uh, a German automotive OEM customer that approaches, approached us with a landscape of hundreds of Atla uh, Apex Cleco uh, DC tools. Their plant maintenance system is SAP PM, um, and they were suffering from manual scheduling of calibration uh, cycles or preventive maintenance cycles for those DC tools. The scope of the project that they wanted us to help them with was connecting to the tools and, you know, alerting when a number of cycles is over a certain threshold and then opening automatically a PM ticket that with, you know, at SAP PM with all the specific tool details so uh, the technicians could be dispatched the next day or the next hour to go and calibrate those tools. The business logic is as simple as David just showed you. It's basically looking at the cycle tag, 
the moment it crosses a certain threshold, you open up a PM ticket. You define the payload that you want to push on SAP PM and you invoke the action. At the same ease of use, you can also open up a ticket in IBM Maximo or Oracle EBS maintenance. Or if it's a manual or legacy or your own scheduling system, and we can support uh, web services, we can support additional ways of you know, REST APIs to, to push data and invoke action. The whole implementation took us less than a day. So we came in, we helped them, we taught them how to operate the tool, and by the, by the time the day was done, the system was in full production for those hundreds of, of tools. Another point I wanted to make here is that this platform also enables you to grow as needed. So if today you're looking at preventive maintenance, but you're starting to think about, hey, I, I want to do predictive maintenance, and I want to push some raw data into uh, uh, some cognitive systems or maybe something that's going to be on-prem, the same platform can collect that raw data, can push it into your enterprise IT for processing, and then you can either open the ticket and potentially even close the ticket later on by identifying the problem was resolved um, with the same business logic that we've just implemented. So I hope um, this was helpful. Um, we tried to give you a quick overview and implementation of how you use DeviceWise uh, for implementing uh, preventive maintenance cycles. Um, as you can imagine, this is useful for a lot of other things within your shop floor data collection projects. And I think at this point, we'll, um, uh, we'll turn it over to some questions and uh, we'll try to address those questions. Great. Thank you so much. We have plenty of questions coming in, so I'm going to start with the first one. And the question is, can the software connect to a device via REST API? Is that something you can answer? David, do you want to take this? Yeah, sure. Uh, the, a RESTful transport or connector will allow you to do that. We have some devices already that are RESTful, all kinds of environmental sensors. They have a small HTTP server. Uh, so we have very purpose-optimized devices for those, device drivers for those. But from a generic standpoint, you could do it a couple of ways. You could do it within the triggers with the scripting language, uh, if, if you would like, or you could use the, the, the HTTP or RESTful interface you saw on the transports. It all depends on the payloads and, and, and the parsing, but yes, you could do it. Okay. Another question is asking, is it possible to create, a, create device groups for a hierarchy tree? David, is that something for you as well? Um, a device, uh, yes. Uh, uh, we don't have a, a concept of device groups per se, but we have a concept of variable groups. So we could have uh, tags or variables across multiple devices in the form of groups. So not at the device level, but, the, but at the variable or tag level, yes, you could create groups. This is used on alarming when you have many devices like DLCs that have common alarming uh, across a, a line, for example, so you create variable groups. Okay. Now, um, obviously a lot of people have VPN and firewalls, so the question that came in is asking how data flows from the cloud to on-premise systems, given the fact that there are these security measures in place. Uh, Device-wise, uh, for factory, for the most part, is an on-prem uh, installation. So there's no uh, no uh, no cloud access necessarily. However, if you use systems that are out on the internet. Uh, you could have uh, HTTPS or go through proxies uh, to to go. So many companies have their own proxying and security, and for the most part, we honor all those. And then you could flow uh, uh, outside of your enterprise. Yeah, just just to add here, so you know, there, there's two layers of firewall. One is you know the DMZ between IT and OT, and we can proxy the communication for a single point. Um, and, and also we have a very robust role-based access control for an outside communication, so you can define 
who has access from the outside world, if at all. And so if you push data to the cloud, you can define that in a very strict uh, fashion with full audit trail of everything that's happening. OK. So another question, and, and thanks for asking them. Keep them coming. There's a lot coming in here, so be prepared, gentlemen. Um, but this other question says that the application seems like a, um, a preventive maintenance type of solution. Does device-wise facilitate predictive maintenance? Uh, I'll, I'll take this. Um, so device-wise is a data collection and processing platform. It, it, is, it enables a wide set of applications. What we gave here is an example of preventive maintenance. At the same ease of use, and I mentioned that before, we can facilitate raw data collection to analytic platforms. And we have connectors to Watson, to Azure, uh, to GCP, to a lot of other um, different type of uh, systems that do machine learning and, and analyze their raw data. Um, we are the facilitator of data exchange. Just, just another comment on that line is, uh, Yes, our presentation today was specific to PM, but it, it's very generic. It's very uh, industry neutral. In discrete manufacturing, for example, device-wise have been used to exchange data between the OT and their MESs. And that's just uh, line control, uh, you know, vehicle control, production control, as built data. So it's just like a Swiss Army knife, so to speak. You could use it for PM, and in addition, you could use it for environmental collection if you have like backnet devices on your shop floor. You could aggregate all that data using the same flowchart. So it's not, it's very industry agnostic and application agnostic. Okay. So this looks like a two part question. I want to make sure that I, I get it right. Um, but the question is what is the sampling order for data collection? And it looks like the second part of the question is, can it collect data from 500 PLCs at the rate of 10 milliseconds? OK, I'll, I'll take that question. Um, that is actually uh, the physics. Are, uh, you're up against the physics to do that kind of data collection at that rate on so many sensors. However, uh, we could attain very high rates of data collection when you leverage the device's ability to send events when needed. Uh, for example, uh, you could have the device send an alarm when it really goes through instead of from device-wise or any system to talk to it and to call it to see if it's true. When you call, you immediately face the physics, right? You cannot do so many cycles. You have CPUs, you have this, you have a network. So if you use an unsolicited approach, you could definitely pump in data from a variety of devices simultaneously. Examples, uh, I could tell you in the Detroit area, we had a uh, automotive facility that connected about 700 Siemens PLCs, so 7300 to um, one big AIX machine. And it wasn't that the AIX machine was powerful. It was that the data was sent on an event, and he was able to keep up. Just to add for here a few things, um, you can also distribute it, distribute uh, device-wise across multiple platforms, and we have partners like Cisco that uh, utilize the distributed uh, approach over uh, their switches and routers. Uh, so potentially you can take and aggregate multiple layers of data collection and break it down. So if you need really intense high-speed sampling rates, then probably you want to push the data collection logic as close to the machine as possible um, versus other different type of uh, deployment architecture. And, and we can cascade uh, device-wise. We can break it down into multiple deployments. OK. So there's a question about node red and asking how do you differentiate device-wise from something like node red? I believe it's sort of that visual programming, if if I'm correct. Or yeah, I, I can I can try to address that. Um, so, Node-RED is um, 
you know, is, is, a, is a good framework for development of application. DeviceWise provides you with an end-to-end -end ability to connect to assets as well as connect to enterprise IT. So it's tailored, I believe, that with Node-RED you'll, you'll spend much more cycles in connecting to the asset. It may be similar on the application engine or the logic creation, but DeviceWise has three major components. One of them is your enterprise IT connectors uh, that David showed. Uh, the other one would be your asset connectors and drivers. And finally would be the logic engine. So you have a single platform, a single tool that provides you with end-to-end -end data collection and processing. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about um, where the software runs. There's a question on where do you run the software. David, can you answer that one? Yeah, sure. So DeviceWise runs on a large variety of, of systems. Of course, runs on Windows, uh, runs on Linux. We have versions that are 32-bit, 64-bit compiled. Runs inside some PLCs, for example, the S7 300 line from Siemens has an adapter, a CP, uh, where we call develop device-wise inside the CP. Same thing with uh, Mitsubishi Electric. There is a, a product that is co-branded, uh, SIT, MSIT. It's co-branded, sorry, it's co-branded MSIT. And then um, it also runs on large uh, mainframes like uh, the IBM P-series computers. Uh, runs in Cisco switches, the IE4Ks, for example, Raspberry Pis, and numerous uh, cellular gateways. So it is pretty flexible where it runs. OK. And why don't we follow that up with this question. Um, and how, how do you license the software? Uh, can, can you answer this. that one? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, so the software is licensed as a, typically as a perpetual license. Um, we also support subscription models. Um, I wouldn't go into pricing right now, but it's 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 based on number of devices and types of enterprise IT connectors. Um, naturally, if you go SQL database, it's a simple connector. If it's a full ERP system, it's an advanced connector. Uh, we're happy to show details, uh, to give more details on a specific uh, um, approach. Okay. So another question, um, do you have an architecture diagram considering on-premise instrumented devices and also devices outside of company borders? Yes, so um, that's a great question. Um, we do, and, and I'm happy to, to take it offline. I don't have that slide immediately available. Um, but basically what, you know, and, and I mentioned that when I started, you know, we're, we're a full end-to-end -end IoT and industrial IoT provider, hardware, software, connectivity, and, and data collection solutions. And as such, you know, we, our device-wise for factory extends into our device-wise cloud platform. So we can provide um, a seamless integration of external sensors, um, internal manufacturing, augment everything, aggregate everything, and then push it from a single cloud aggregate to your target destination, which might be an on-prem data system or a cloud-based data system. And we support multiple types of deployment. And again, I'm happy to take this offline and, and explore and give uh, more details about uh, potential implementation. OK. Yeah, we can, we can follow up with folks on, on the webinar as well. Um, the details are here, by the way. Yeah, the de yeah exactly. You can <laughs> read <laughs> There's your email. So if you want to um, reach out to Doobie personally with that question and, and have a conversation there. Um, so how about this? Does device-wise support MQTT communication? We're hearing a lot about this communication protocol lately, so it's a good question. Yeah, so so this is David. I'll take it. Uh, yes, yeah, so remember on the flowcharts we had the events. So one of the events could be an MQTT publish. Uh, or we could, so we basically, under the covers, we subscribe to an MQTT uh, topic on some broker and then when somebody posts an event our device wise the trigger will run so we 
uh, participate on the MQTT uh, messaging. As a matter of fact, DeviceWise internally is a gigantic MQTT uh, broker and pops up uh, engines all around. So we're familiar with it. We are. Uh, we have uh, some external sensors that we're familiar with that do MQTT and participate in the entire device-wise triggering scheme of things. So we do support it and familiar with it. Yes. Okay. Now, um, you know, we started off the presentation just talking about all the, the different types of equipment that's out there. So the question is, what do I do on older assets that don't have any connectivity options? David, can you take that one? Uh, absolutely. So we, uh, th there is, uh, there are many legacy equipment that uh, maybe cannot be instrumented or is cost prohibited to instrument. Uh, some maybe have a serial port, some may have nothing. So what I, I tell it, we created this small device called the Atom Box, where you could connect external sensors, like a current sensor or contacts. In, it has digital inputs, some digital outputs, and some analog ins. And then what this device does is does some pre-processing close to the device and delivers the data unsolicited as a transaction into device wise. So now. Uh, we have uh, one or two companies that uh, have completely retooled their infrastructure because they were able to sense uh, what machines uh, are actually really needed or not. So th there is the capability. It's called the Atom Box, and we'll be happy to provide some some uh, information on this device. Okay, great. Um, so, Jimmy, you had given us some description about the German automo automotive OEM implementation, and you said it took one day and no time, no downtime. And um, I think there's some skeptics in the crowd because we've got a question asking, seriously, no downtime? That doesn't sound realistic. Dubi, can you address that? Yes. Um, so, yes, seriously, there was no downtime. And because we connect to the assets and we can connect in a non-invasive way, um, it is doesn't disrupt your uh, flow of manufacturing and you know if it doesn't convince you then challenge us you know we're more than happy to take the challenge and show you how easy it is to implement on your own environment in your own landscape uh, we can do that remotely or we can come on site so um, I'm opening this up for a challenge uh, to show anybody in the audience to uh, let us demonstrate that I'm sure they love a challenge. So again, we're going to invite them to email you and contact you and kick you up on that challenge. Yeah, and it's been um, recorded, so I cannot. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You can't back down now. Um, okay. Well, I'm, I'm wrapping up. I have another question here about. It's asking, can you hook into the alarming function of the DC tools? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take that question. Um, the, uh, the Atlas and the Apex and basically any open protocol compliant uh, DC tool has the ability to send alarming to if you subscribe to it. And the most common one uh, is, of course, the, the number of rundowns because after so many rundowns, some things need to be sent for, for calibration. So back to the event and the trigger, you could subscribe, so to speak, to an event that is the alarm from the controller. When that alarm comes in, your trigger runs and you create the PM ticket. Basically, two steps to, to let the tool tell you when the preventive maintenance kind of operation needs to happen. So the answer is, is yes. Okay, great. Well, listen, um, we are wrapping up the discussion. I want to, again, remind everybody and invite everybody, if you have other questions that you want to address with Juby or David offline, their email are right, is right here. Um, and there's some other information on tele.iotuniversity.com, so you are invited to log on there and participate in that. I want to thank our speakers, Juby and David, for a great presentation and educating us on the new ways to ease preventive maintenance tasks. And thank you all for joining us today. If you're unable to get your questions, we'll be sure to follow up with you. And you can listen to this webinar again on demand within the next 24 to 48 hours. So that's it for today. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, everybody.